Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to day two of Derail 2018. We are excited to facilitate a full day of presentations in order today. Look at that. <laughs> the weather has cooperated. Um, so uh, just a couple of housekeeping remarks. Um, please remember to fill out and turn in your evaluation forms today at the social media table in the back of the room. Um, if you would prefer to wait to fill those out until after the conference, there is a form that is on our website. Um, you'll also get it emailed to you if you've registered. I would like again to draw attention to our anti-harassment policy. Please read through that and email us if you need to report anything. If you need to take space, our semi-quiet room is at the back of the conference room. Um, please leave as you need to. Um, and on that note, if you could please make sure that bags and coats are away from aisle spaces so people can move freely without worrying about safety. Registered attendees are invited to join us on our collaborative notes document. Please email the derail Gmail if you are having trouble with access and your program has information about connecting to the Wi-Fi. Please use our hashtag derail2018 for all of your social media posts and follow us on Twitter at derailforum. If you are taking photographs, please pay attention to the color of folks' lanyards. If someone's wearing a red lanyard, please ask them before capturing their photograph. And in preparation for our unconference this afternoon, um, in-person attendees should take notes of different topics that they're interested in discussing more at the end of the day. All right, so unless there are any questions, great. Um, next, or to start us off today, we have Simmons student Lena Gluck um, and her presentation, Intellectual Freedom, Racial Subjugation, and Class Suppression, A Brief History of Library Neutrality. Thank you, Lena. Good morning. Hmm? Oh, is this the correct one now? Okay. Earlier, it was the other way around. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Perfect. All right, now we're ready. I am super short, so I apologize if you can barely see any of me. So I wanted to start out with this quote that I have seen passed around online a whole lot, and it kind of represents a lot of things that I've seen passed around online quite a lot by generally left librarians who I pretty much agree with, but I kind of want to challenge the quote in this presentation a bit. And the quote is that libraries are innately subversive institutions born of the radical notion that every single member of society deserves free, high-quality access to knowledge and culture. I agree that is a radical notion, but I disagree that libraries are innately subversive institutions, and I want to bring into context the larger history of libraries in the United States and how we do have this kind of tale of two histories, a um, dynamic in which there has been a long history of activism within librarianship, but there have also been some extraordinarily disturbing beginnings, and we will not get anywhere in our further activism unless we can acknowledge the history that we came from. And I also want to specify that it makes a difference in saying that libraries are not innately subversive, because if we imply that they are, we are minimizing the work that activists have done since then to change the profession. And I would like to reframe this as not innately subversive institutions, but libraries are institutions which have been intentionally subverted by hardworking activists for many, many decades. So let's talk about the original US librarian, all right? So this were like book clubs for rich white dudes. That is essentially what we're talking about. They like compiled their own private collections, which was mostly stuff that they used for work and like the Bible and like religious stuff. And they were like, hey, like we can all share 
and that's the collection. And the first librarians were basically people guarding the collection so other people would not steal their books. And these are not very radical beginnings. In fact, they are specifically really shitty. And <laughs> I, it's good to not kid ourselves. Um, the original public libraries, when this became actually um, accessible to more than just those rich white dudes, um, was in the early 1800s. And in 1854, there was the start of the first libraries that didn't need the subscription fees to be able to enter them. But even here, what was happening and why this opened up were not out of noble reasons. It was primarily because there was a growth of industrialization and urbanization and immigration and the intense xenophobia and classism of these upper class white men was growing. They were very nervous and they were kind of coming up with ways to figure out how to deal with the idleness of the working class because they did not want people organizing against them and they were very nervous about the subversive ideas that were being talked about and they had this idea and they were like, we could assimilate all these immigrants to our proper United States Anglo-Saxon values. And you know, we could make sure that the lower class like understands our upper class values. And we can do all this by promoting the right reading. And there was a big movement in this time where um, there was public literacy and education and libraries, all this public information being pushed out. And this was essentially a movement to, you know, instill and indoctrinate people with these values in an effort to make sure that they would not be reached by the more subversive content that was going around in working class and immigrant communities at the time. And in this, we see the foundation of the MLS and why master's degrees were kind of required in this because they needed to make sure that libraries were staffed by people from the right families, which meant wealthy white women. And to be able to ensure that these were the only people who would be staffing the libraries and instilling these values, they had to make sure that there was a tremendous price that had to be reached on a certain class level. And we see the effects of this today in a absolutely horrifically white dominated profession. Early on, um, segregation and white supremacy were built into the core foundation of librarianship. Um, everything from how our collection development was created to our different systems of classification, which I won't go into because that's about like three presentations on its own. <laughs> and, uh, it's really important to note that African American folks were literally not allowed in libraries um, until literally they kind of did it themselves and they were like, all right, fine, I guess, then we will just do our own thing if you'll not let us in. Um, but even after that, libraries were really strictly segregated. And so even when folks were opening their own libraries, um, in 1828, the Reading Room Society was the first social library for African-American folks, and that opened in Philadelphia. And um, in 1831 was the Female Literary Society, and that was um, specifically for black women in the US. And that was also founded in Philadelphia. And so these were kind of created um, by and for people of color in the communities who were otherwise not able to access any library services at all. And if the segregation weren't absolutely horrific enough, what was going on in a lot of the white libraries was that this uh, white supremacist group called the United Daughters of the Confederacy had this idea. Um, they were very upset at their loss of the Civil War, of course, and they decided that to try to redeem their image, they were going to just start spreading like pro-slavery propaganda to children, and that was like their big thing. And so what they did was they just like generated a bunch of children's books that had this propaganda in it really, really blatantly and donated it to libraries all across the country. And the librarians were like, oh, this is so nice. We have all these free books. We'll just put that in our collection. And thus came like a huge generation of indoctrinating little white kids into white supremacy. Um, so that was a whole thing. Um, in, <laughs> yeah, 
children's librarianship has some dark beginnings. It's really disturbing. Um, so anyway, then in 1833, um, I had mentioned previously uh, the different literary communities um, and libraries that were formed um, by and for people of color. And in 1833, um, Philadelphia's black community decided because the Library Company of Philadelphia, which was the overlying organization, would not allow any people of color, they were like, all right then, like, like we have been doing, we will just build our own. And they did some really cool shit and they were promoting literature and science and had readings and debates and lectures and public speakers and were really turning it into a community space. And um, in a Boston-based abolitionist newspaper um, in um, 1833, when this was first arising, there was actually a passage in it, um, and I wanted to read that to you because I thought it was really cool that even over in Boston, they were like, hey, check out what they're doing, that's awesome. Um, so it was, we, the people of color of this city, being deeply impressed with the necessity of promoting among our rising youth a proper cultivation for literary pursuits and the improvement of the faculties and powers of their minds, deem it necessary to state for the information of our friends wherever situate that we have succeeded in organizing an institution under the title of the Philadelphia Library Company of Colored Persons. And that was pretty excellent. Also pretty excellent, um, there were these two wealthy abolitionists that kind of took the strategy that that white supremacist women's group used and then did the opposite. And they were like, all right, we have all this anti-slavery literature and we're just gonna donate it, like, yes. So they did that and it was super cool. Um, and they were super dedicated activists even before then, but they got this idea and they donated a whole bunch of stuff to Howard University in DC. Um, so one of the things that also comes into this library history um, is the idea of nationalism and censorship. And the idea of libraries as promoting intellectual freedom really did not come until later. Um, and in fact, in the early 1900s during World War I, there was a very um, high rate of persecuting anti-war li librarians and like directly weeding and censoring materials that were deemed unpatriotic. And this was just kind of a strategical political alliance that the library kind of as a profession decided to take because they're like, hey, you know, if we align with the government and with businesses, then we get in good with them, we get funding, we've got a whole like system here. And it was a very intentionally cultivated system. Um, and in this system, what was built into the fabric of librarianship were these four components of the essential United States ideology. And later on when we start talking about what quote unquote neutrality means, it basically is these principles. And these are the things that are the unspeakable framework that anything that challenges it is deemed unneutral. Um, so I wanted to you know, kind of read through these and just emphasize them because it will come back again and again. There's the element of white supremacy and black inferiority. There's xenophobia and nationalism. The idea of capitalism as natural and necessary and the universally just foreign policy of the United States. Um, and essentially just the belief that anything the United States does is of course the best possible thing they could have done only country on earth. Um, so, anywho, um, in 1938, um, there was this social scientist, um, and he like, was one of the first people to bring up the idea of not being neutral, um, specifically, and he's like, you know, I think that people probably should be taking a stand um, in, in libraries, and he was just kind of observing, and he um, said, you know, that institutions should not seek to be neutral between democracy and dictatorship or between intelligence and stupidity and prejudice or between general public welfare and special interests. And so he was kind of articulating this very early social responsibilities um, argument that comes up later. And um, it's also important to note though, like his primary concern was in standing against censorship specifically and protecting the librarians um, who did, rather than allying his profession with human rights. He was more concerned about making sure that people would not be persecuted for what they said 
in their position than particular human rights um, views. And um, the Librarian of Congress at the time um, stated that the purpose of libraries was to, quote, record the greatest learning and the most responsible intelligence the country can provide. And this discourse laid the framework for the establishment of the Library Bill of Rights in 1939, which stated explicitly that the American Library Association stood against censorship. So this is where we get the kind of censorship framework laid out. Um, however, there was controversy during the Cold War because they had taken the stand of being like, all right, we're against censorship, but also they were super scared of communists, and they were like, oh my God, guys, socialism, though. Can we still censor that, though? I mean, I know we had that thing, but um, still. And so there was kind of turmoil going on because they were like, okay, traditionally we've been doing this like very patriotic thing, and I feel like I don't know where we sit here. So there was a lot of kind of turmoil in that. And you know, on the more like progressive end of things, there was some of the ALA that were like, we don't really want loyalty investigations going on because there was a thing for a while where they were like, yeah, like you'll have to sign your you know, allegiance to the United States to be able to be a librarian. Like you really need to, you know, we need to make sure that you promise you are on our side no matter what or you can't work here. Um, and they were like, that seems a little much. That seems a little much. But then there was the other undercurrents. And I'm about to share a slide that has some homophobic language, so content warning. Um, this will be a quote um, by the Librarian of Congress in 1947. And this was pretty much the position at that point. Um, and it was very blunt. And so there was a very big anxiety, even though they were claiming this kind of intellectual freedom and you know, um, anti-censorship, there was still a massive and pervasive dialogue of not wanting anyone whose politics were too radical, too left, and they were also super scared of gay people because they were super homophobic. Um, and there began a trend of outing and expelling any librarian that was suspected of being gay or communist. Um, from the Library of Congress, and then before too long, they kind of backslid, and they're fighting against the loyalty oath tests um, to maintain employment. They kind of lost that battle for a while and actually were required to do that, and it was kind of a mess. Um, then comes the original um, political purpose of the argument for libraries being neutral. And a lot of this came from librarians being very scared that they were going to be outed and accused of being a communist um, for their various political views. And so the idea was by providing all points of view, they could have, there would be no concrete proof of what their actual views were because they're like, well, I said everything, so you can't say that I said anything in particular. That's how that works. And um, it was essentially like a defense mechanism. And they were like, okay, like, you can't, you can't fire me for providing this text because I also provided this other one. And it was a really weird dynamic because it was inherently a pretense kind of thing. Um, there was this idea of like, I'm providing all the perspectives, but they were doing so to make sure that nobody thought that they were communist. And so it was like essentially the baseline had to be a support for capitalism in order to you know, create that neutrality as it was presented. And um, it was, uh, librarians were following the trend in the profession, and it was very much a kind of mess in, in terms of what was happening to librarians who were genuinely progressive um, and were very left because the idea behind it was asserting that it was okay to fire librarians for having those views. You just shouldn't fire librarians who were mistakenly accused of having those views. And so that was kind of the line in the sand and where the idea of neutrality came in. So during, um, in 1939, Philip and Mary Jane Ken Keeney um, founded the Progressive Librarians Council. And this was years and years before the Progressive Librarians Guild. And it wasn't exactly the same thing, but it came from a similar framework. And um, they were super radical for the time and were 
like jumping into librarianship, like, all right, we're going to reform ALA, we're going to be like super anti-censorship, and we want job security for librarians, we want better library services for remote communities, we want all this stuff, and then where they kind of like went a little bit too far and then ended up getting, you know, booted out of the profession a bit was um, during the Spanish Civil War, they were smuggling money to librarian left leftist resistance members who were exiled in France. And they were like, hey, like these anti-fascists, like we're gonna give them money. And then they were kind of viewed as like a national security threat. And so then when they wanted to go start library services in socialist nations, they were denied passports. And they kind of got booted from the profession. But it was like a flare and then out again. Um, Ruth Brown in 1951, um, was a white librarian who was fired for essentially supporting desegregation. And the official reason why she was fired from her position was providing subversive materials to the public. But when it was really investigated, like her collections were not that different from the surrounding libraries' collections. It was mostly just that she was not racist and was working with the black community towards desegregation, and so she got the boot. And um, Officially, IFC and ALA condemned her firing, and they were like, hey, you know, we have this whole anti-censorship thing, like you shouldn't be firing people for their politics, um, but their support for her, one, did not get her her job back. Um, it was just kind of a statement that was like, well, that was bad. And also, it wasn't really in support of her anti-racist politics, it was just being like, hey, like, librarians shouldn't be fired just for their views, guys. And there, it, this case particularly, um, create, like it, sh it demonstrates this dissonance um, between the supposed defense of intellectual freedom while deliberately having a system that denies all information and library access to anyone of color, and specifically to African American folks. And they apparently didn't seem to understand that that did not make any sense. Um, so anyway, that's what happened when somebody from inside the system tried to do something. She got fired. And then I want to contrast this with somebody from outside the system. Um, Ronald McNair, when he was nine years old, he was like, all right, direct action time. I'm going to go into the segregated library and just refuse to leave until they let me get my book because, damn it, I want it. And he was a little badass. And. Um, <laughs> And uh, they called the police and his mom, and they were like, you gotta, you gotta leave, kid. And he's like, no, though, I'm not gonna. And he ended up like not only leading to the desegregation of that library, but eventually, years later, the library is not named after him. Um, and he ended up being a physicist and worked in um, NASA, and he was an astronaut. He was super cool. Um, and now there is a children's book about him um, practicing civil disobedience in that library. So that's pretty cool. The moral of that story is direct action works, kids. <laughs> um, so the idea of intellectual freedom. Um, in 1953, President Eisenhower came out in support of the anti-censorship policies in libraries. And so the public generally is starting to really strongly associate libraries with the defense of intellectual freedom and anti-censorship views at this point. Um, but while this is happening and while there's this kind of surface understanding, like this is what librarianship is, um, throughout the 1950s, most librarians are removing books by blacklisted authors. And there was a uh, study published at the end of the decade called Book Selection and Censorship, a study of school and public libraries in California, and they found that nearly a fifth of librarians routinely avoided any controversial material, and the majority had decided on omitting at least one book from their collection due to the content. So while they are you know, having this public perception of anti-censorship, they're also all pretty much under the table being like, but we all do it though, right guys? So whatever. Um, and there was also these IFC training sessions that were happening um, during 1952 to 1955 on how to implement the Library Bill of Rights without <laughs> becoming susceptible to communist ideology, which I just think is really funny um, <laughs> because they were like, wait though, like our Bill of Rights sounds a little too like equal to me. 
this is suspicious. Like maybe we gotta like freeze this just right um, to not, not accidentally lead to what we were fearing the whole time. Um, so there was a real tension going on between activists and librarians. Um, the white librarians did not desegregate library spaces of their profession willingly. Um, and it honestly, like there were some activists working from inside librarianship, but most of the time the actual strides towards desegregation came from direct action from black activists. And um, there was this, you know, really intense, um, like blind spot in librarianship that was on, honestly probably very intentional and of this idea of like well we have we are very strong in like intellectual freedom we're very committed to information access um, and there was this publication in 1960 um, that was called the first freedom liberty and justice in the world of books and reading um, which was intended to explore censorship even outside the United States, it was supposed to be this like global like analysis of information access. And throughout the entire text, like they just conveniently forget to mention segregation, makes it so like nobody could fucking get information here. <laughs> and they, that just like slipped their mind. They're like, oh yeah, that that no whatever. And yeah, so there was just a lot of real, uh, you know, purposeful washing over of that issue through a lot of discussion on intellectual freedom. Um, one particular activist group that I wanted to bring attention to um, were these folks up here um, in the Tougaloo College. Um, they staged sit-ins at segregated public institutions in Mississippi, and this was in 1961. Um, and they would go in and you know try to read and just like not leave until they were dragged out. They were each fined a hundred dollars and given a thirty day suspended sentence and a year's probation. But through their efforts, um, by 1962, partially as a result of this event, the ALA membership adopted a statement on individual membership, chapter status, and institutional membership which stated that the membership in the association and its chapters had to be open to everyone regardless of race, religion, or personal belief. Now this didn't necessarily ban all desegregation, um, or ban segregation in the libraries, um, but it was like advice. They were like, all right, we're making a statement, like you should let folks in. So that was something. Um, by 1967, there was discussion because of all this activism going on and inside the ALA, um, they were starting to be like, well, if we don't do something like maybe, you know, maybe we have to, to make sure that there's not an actual revolution going on. <laughs> like, and so they were, they were scared by the activists. And I think that it's really important to note that one of the main reasons that librarianship has been improved to where we see it today is because they were literally just scared to do otherwise. Like their hands were forced into it. And I think that that is something to remember in activism today is that, you know, you shouldn't be wary to force people's hands if you need progress to happen. Um, so basically by 1967, librarians realized they needed to take the current um, social justice movement seriously. Um, and they were really fearing uprising. They were very nervous and this led to a transforming of librarianship starting and in 1954 the united states supreme court decision encouraged desegregation of libraries and ala chapters and the civil rights act of 1964 prohibited racial segregation in schools workplace and in public accommodations and the remaining segregated libraries were kind of dragged into acceptance of like basic steps towards information access um, and a huge part of how this happened was a civil rights activist and NAACP board member and librarian had this awesome idea. He was working in ALA and he's like, all right, I have a proposal to make. And how about like all the assholes who like are still segregating their libraries? Like how about we're just, we just like don't let them show up to any of our conferences. Like we're just like, no, you can't sit with us. 
and that <laughs> and that passed and it super worked and those like remaining libraries who were still segregating kind of dragged their feet and they're like oh, okay I guess we'll desegregate because we want to come to the conference too guys um, so he he did that like he he created that proposal and it passed and it was super rad. He also was the founder of the Black Caucus um, and this was created in 1969 by black librarians and information professionals to address the unmet needs by the ALA. However, the ALA um, did not officially um, consider them affiliated with them until 1992. So it's quite a few years in between. Um, also, in 1968, um, during an ALA conference, the Social Responsibilities Roundtable was created. And the um, quote in its creation was that it was created on behalf of black militants, political radicals, members of women's liberation groups, and individuals interested in library unions. And you can see a very strong um, left undercurrent. You know, this was a roundtable created by and for activists. And um, this also puns. I, I found this image, and it's really adorable and dorky. <laughs> yes, yeah, I just read that before I switch to the next slide. Um, <laughs> but um, yes, and then uh, Congress for Change, I, I want to bring up because it kind of reminds me of derail to a, a certain d degree. Um, in spring of 1969, there was a group of library students from the University of Maryland, and they gathered for a two-day session, and they're like, okay, we need to just shake things up at ALA. Like, that's what we want to do. When we get out into the professional world, like, let's do some shit. And so they teamed up with the Social Responsibilities Roundtable, and they're like, okay, y'all are already doing good work. We want to join that. Like, what can we do? Like, let's work together on this. How can, how can we push ALA? And they threatened to launch a campaign to just straight up like discourage membership in ALA unless they took them seriously. And they're like, all right, like listen to us or we're gonna make sure none of these young professionals join y'all. So like you better shape up. And it worked to some extent, like it, the ALA did listen. Um, so the ALA responds by establishing the Activities Committee on New Directions for ALA, ACONDA, right? And so then ACONDA proposed responsibilities of ALA explicitly including social responsibilities created in coordination with the Social Responsibilities Roundtable. However, then there was the ad hoc committee on Aconda, which was called Anaconda. This is real. <laughs> and this was formed to make recommendations on the proposal. And when they did this, the mention of social responsibilities just disappeared mysteriously and they kind of like sidestepped the responsibility like that. It just got lost in the bureaucracy of the anaconda, um, which is just super lame. Um, so yeah, and um, let's see where I went. Activism inside librarianship, yes. Okay, so the Social Responsibilities Roundtable um, and individual progressive librarians continued to work to change the profession from within. But then the IRS started getting really freaked out. And they're like, no, no, the librarians aren't supposed to do this. And they, they started like complaining to ALA. And they're like, OK, you need to get the SRRT in line because they're like doing subversive shit. And this was not part of the deal. And so the ALA was basically threatened with losing their tax exemption um, and possibly facing other financial, legal, or social consequences. And so, you know, the ALA kind of used this as like, well, we're not going to adopt, you know, your suggestions because we need this money and we're not going to do that. Um, but while, while this was on the surface, the kind of decision that was being made, there was a lot of grassroots action by individual librarians who were starting to implement the values of the Social Responsibilities Roundtable just in their own circles of influence and publishing articles about how to do the same for other folks who were similarly inclined. So even though the official ALA stance did not change here, a lot of communication was happening and organization between different librarians. Um, and some of the examples of what these articles were about and subject 
Um, there were um, articles on librarians' role in aiding movements for nuclear disarmament, um, allying with the working poor, disability activism, support for battered women, rights for gay folks, and um, the need for eliminating prejudice and subject access headings. So there was a lot of really good work being done kind of under the table. Um, and then there was this guy, and he irks me. Um, he published the, the Flight from Reason in 1975. And he, the whole premise of his book was that um, social responsibility was extremist, and extremism was terrible, just absolutely bad all the time. And he believed that social responsibility and intellectual freedom were mutually exclusive. You could not have both, and it was very clear which one he favored. And he kind of had this idea, which we see repeated a lot today, the kind of framing of it now is, you know, that horseshoe theory kind of thing where it's like all extremists are the same, even if they're arguing the exact opposite things. And, um, and that was very much his thing. And he wanted libraries to stop talking about social issues because he believed that, you know, true intellectual freedom was ignoring most of the world. Um, <laughs> And there was this one quote in my research, and I just wanted to make a meme out of it because I had to. Um, so <laughs> this guy has a quote in his book that was like, the ALA does not exist to promote homosexualism as a lifestyle. And I'm like, no. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. So anyway, then comes the Progressive Librarians Guild, and they're super rad. And they are like the far left element of the Social Responsibilities Roundtable. Um, they were created in 1990 because they were kind of like, okay, we love the Social Responsibilities Roundtable, like they're near and dear to our hearts, but they're not, like they're losing steam, and we need to like amp up that radical element that it started with. And so they have this quote in the creation of PLG that was like, we exist to expose and call out librarianship's active and passive complicity and acceptance of those systems to offer and practice alternatives to those systems and to empower the voices of those excluded from positions of power and or the historical record and to develop a praxis that contributes to ongoing pursuits of human rights and dignity. They are you know, specifically like, all right, we exist to kind of follow ALA around, just call them out all the time. We're just like, all right, here's what you're doing, and it's messed up, and we're going to talk about it now. Um, they have never, since their founding, accepted the idea of neutrality, and they're explicitly political. If you visit their website today, they have a whole list of their um, commitments to human rights and their specific alignment with various activist groups and they are also explicitly anti-capitalist. Um, so then we have, um, in 1970, um, there was the ALA's Task Force on Gay Liberation, um, and this was the first LGBT professional organization in the United States. And this is pretty cool. Um, in 1992, um, the Gay and Lesbian Task Force, as it was called at that point, um, at a uh, parade when holding up a banner, um, they had their photo taken and that ended up on the American Library's cover, which was very cool. However, on all the forums and the reaction from the majority of the library base, there was tremendous backlash and it was one of the most controversial um, cover images ever. And there was a whole lot of like really, really homophobic and awful language. Um, there was this one uh, comment that was um, posted on, ooh, that's not what I want to do, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> posted on the forums um, after seeing this image by someone saying, after receiving your July, August issue, I was shocked to see you glorifying and linking the homosexual movement with the American Library Association. While fully understanding of the ALA's position on censorship and agreeing with it, and understanding that there are those in our society with different lifestyles and tolerating it, I guess. I still find it reprehensible as an association I am a member of chooses to glorify homosexuals. So you can see that like even with like surface level strides, there's still an amazingly intense backlash. Um, so. The, um, however, activism continues, it moves forward. Um, 
And one of the really big moves that the ALA has taken in recent years is opposing the Patriot Act. Um, and this, their stance on this was largely due to internal pressure from activist librarians. Um, and this was a really, really big move to directly oppose a federal law um, because previously the ALA had very much been, you know, absolutely in the pocket of the government and being like, all right, like we'll agree with whatever, that's fine. And now like here were some librarians being like, no, <laughs> we're, we're not actually gonna hand over all our patron records and you know, if we have to, we're gonna make a real stink about it. We're just gonna be ridiculous and just never stop talking. And um, so that was really cool and radical. And um, it represented the interests of people over loyalty to the government, which was a huge, huge thing. Um, and it creates precedent for today. I think that it's really important to remember that there is precedent for ALA specifically being against something that the government is enacting. Um, and when we're arguing about what's possible for ALA to do in the future, we need to remember that like this exists, like this is an actual thing that they openly opposed. Um, and one of the reasons why they were able to openly oppose it is because of the first, um, <laughs> she was the first woman, the first African-American and the first African-American woman to be Library of Congress, getting that intersectionality representation going on. And um, she was the president of the ALA from 2003 to 2004. And so she was able to really like bump up the activist movement within ALA and really like be a leading voice against the Patriot Act. Um, and so one of the things that we see is that once the profession became desegregated, you know, even just a little bit, um, black activists coming into the profession have been able to create a much more activist profession um, than it previously had been, and it's moved it in a direction that it wasn't previously, but it can be. And I think that it's really important to recognize that aspect of it. Um, as many of y'all know, um, in Ferguson, um, the library there got a lot of attention um, after the murder of Michael Brown um, and after the judge decided to not charge the officer who killed him um, in 2014. And the library stayed open even when schools wouldn't and they organized over 100 volunteers to help take care of children who didn't have anywhere to go during the day. They created um, like healing kits for kids, there were mental health services, and there was this real um, idea of making the library into what the community needed and responding actively to community needs instead of just closing down and being like, well, it's not our responsibility to do anything. Um, and so this kind of created a model that other libraries have really um, taken to um, um, across the states when they are um, dealing with you know, political unrest um, right near their, in their communities. And being able to have this precedent of being like, you know, libraries need to engage, not disengage with our communities. Um, and so now we have um, a very active activist group of librarians um, of which you are all a part, I am assuming. And we have this whole element to our profession um, where we are practicing solidarity with marginalized folks and we are very strongly against library neutrality and um, one of the hashtags that I absolutely love is no neutral libraries because it's just so blatant. And there is this element that is really radical within librarianship and that we can respect and join forces with. Um, and I think that, you know, bringing back to my original point, like we shouldn't claim that librarianship has always been radical or that it's inherently so. Um, for one, that's false as we've seen. And for another, that only creates a dynamic where we seek validation from our history in order to justify our decisions for where we want the profession to go. And I kind of want to emphasize that like we will be the librarians, we get to decide what librarianship is. We don't have to justify it with the history of what it was because it used to be a bunch of rich dudes in a book club. So like, you know, 
<laughs> we come a long way. Um, so, you know, I think that, um, you know, we shouldn't necessarily, like if we're talking about anti-racist and anti-fascist librarianship, you know, we shouldn't um, drift into the argument of like, you know, well, we should do this because it's historically aligned with activist and librarianship. Um, we should do it because it's ethically right and because we can. Um, and that should be our guiding principle, not trying to like match it with history, but trying to be like, what do we have the resources to do and what's possible and let's strive for it because it's right. Um, and we need to remember that like activists have changed librarianship in the past. It's not an impenetrable fortress. You know, it's not like there's no chance for change. We're not locked into the system, which is highly problematic and, you know, is super racist in its institution and there's a lot of issues with it. And those things are all true and it also is important to remember that those things are not permanent. Um, so I wanted to talk about entering the profession, um, the lessons we can draw from history in terms of what tactics have worked in the past to change librarianship and so therefore what we can use um, as we go forward um, and these kind of ideas that we have precedent where it's like this was successful before so let's try it again kind of thing. New tactics will probably work too but I just wanted to see you know what have worked in the past because obviously it's changed a lot. So just as like a recap, first strategy, organize. There has been so much work done with joining professional organizations um, like the Progressive Librarians Guild, like the Social Responsibilities Roundtable, um, like the Black Caucus, or even small political groups. Um, and it's really important to you know, read up on what's already happening and get informed on who's already working towards the goals that you have and team up and see how you can help and share ideas. And it's kind of a, you know, the more the merrier, you gotta have solidarity with folks. Um, so stay in the loop on what's actively being done and join those efforts because there's strength in numbers. Um, strategy two, be uncooperative. There is a long legacy of librarians just like not cooperating with power and it's great. And, um, you know, one of the examples is the um, librarians um, after the IRS was threatening ALA and is like, you can't adopt these socially responsible principles. A lot of them were like, okay, we'll just publish about it then. And if people happen to implement them, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, or, you know, straight up like opposing the Patriot Act. And like some of them did that while not technically doing anything illegal. Um, like that sign I put up where it's like the FBI hasn't been here today. Watch closely for the removal of this sign because they weren't legally allowed to tell people if the FBI had come to take patron files, but they could tell them that they hadn't come yet and to watch to see if the sign was removed. Um, and today, uh, you know, modern example of this is a lot of librarians are just straight up refusing to cooperate with ICE and helping marginalized patrons with information on protecting themselves. Um, there's a bunch of resources um, for folks on just how to resist ICE in general and um, civil rights while protesting and just a bunch of ways that you can aid activist communities and aid marginalized folks in your communities just through being uncooperative to power and helping others be uncooperative to power. Um, strategy three, donate materials. <laughs> um, it's worked before. Um, and, you know, we've seen um, Arthur and Lewis Tappan donating all the anti-slavery books. We've seen the shitty white supremacist women trying to do this shit too. But the point is that it works. Like, it's a tactic that is successful. If you know your library is not going to improve their collection, then just donate a bunch of shit and make sure that, that you can, you know, justify it to them, but like get it in there. Um, make sure it won't just end up in their book sale, but go through traditional channels as much as possible and offer new hard covers and back them up with like an organized effort where they suddenly get a bunch of requests through their like little form to request books and everyone's like, yeah, I really want this book. Just like coordinate a group of people to just keep asking for it and then just come to them and be like, I paid for it, isn't that great? Now we have it. Um, <laughs> and. Um, you know, you can create both the public relations problem and solution at the same time, and it's great. 
Um, strategy number four, direct action. We have seen over and over again um, civil rights activists staging sit-ins in libraries, and that created you know, our desegregation of libraries that we have today. A more modern example, um, there was um, a whole series of white supremacist um, like meetings in um, public library spaces that anyone who was around yesterday, I was talking about that a little bit, and basically what their tactic was was to like rent out the library meeting room space and to try to you know spread their like propaganda and um, recruit and be really shitty and so um, one of them um, in September 14th 2012 um, Matt Hale who was um, the leader of this neo-nazi group um, in uh, Wakefield Massachusetts he was um, trying to have a speech at the Wakefield town of Bay Bay Public Library and um, hundreds of people arrived to protest the speech and the neo-nazis and there was such a ruckus in the um, in the protest that um, they were able to just like shut down the library for the day and like you know, just caused enough chaos that the library had to change its policy um, so that way it wouldn't be able to happen again. And so, well, through direct channels, um, or through official channels, rather, it wouldn't have necessarily prevented that. Um, using direct action, they were able to basically run the neo-Nazis out of town, and they didn't come back. Um, and so they were able to keep people safe in that way, and then also um, promote the change of future policy. Um, and strategy five, make your own. Um, creating your own libraries, your own community centers, your own anarchist collectives, your own literature, zine libraries. Um, if the system refuses to make it, you still can. Um, and so it's important to not forget you know, the potential of just individuals working collaboratively in solidarity with other individuals who have those community needs. Um, and from history, you know, it's important to remember, like when folks of color weren't allowed in libraries or library organizations, they made their own based on their community needs, and they ended up freaking awesome. Like, they were really awesome and important. And when ALA and mainstream publishing isn't meeting your needs, don't be afraid to go outside of it and keep creating anyway. Um, and so I want to end with just a general sentiment and summary is that I want everyone to go out and make a ruckus. Like, the time for quiet librarianship is over. We're going to make noise, and we're never going to shut up until we get some change. So thank you. <laughs>